It's our great honor to host the Maine Cl Climate Council on the University of Maine campus today and to welcome and introduce Maine Governor Janet Mills in a, in a minute. Uh, welcome also to so many others who uh, have made their way here for this very important meeting today. Um, Hannah Pingree, Director of the Governor's Office of uh, Policy Innovation in the Future, Commissioner Melanie Loizen, Representative Michelle Dunphy, Representative Lydia Bloom, uh, and all who have uh, who've been a part of this work for such a long time and now are able to celebrate one year anniversary of Maine Won't Wait. Um, Governor Mills has made climate action a top priority for her administration and is providing the incredible leadership that our state needs right now to confront the climate challenges we face um, as a state, as a nation, and as a planet for now and into the future. The University of Maine system is a committed partner in this work and here at the state's public research university, we're helping to lead climate understanding and action, and together we're ready to do even more. I'd like to do our land acknowledgement at this time. The University of Maine recognizes that it is located on Marsh Island in the homeland of the Penobscot Nation, where issues of water and territorial rights and encroachment upon sacred sites are ongoing. Penobscot homeland is connected to the other Wabanaki tribal nations, the Passamaquoddy, Maliseet, and Mi'kmaq, through kinship, alliances, and diplomacy. The university also recognizes that the Penobscot Nation and the other Wabanaki tribal nations are distinct sovereign legal and political entities with their own powers of self-governance and self-determination. A year ago today, the Maine Climate Council released Maine Won't Wait, a bold four-year plan that lays out a pathway to respond to climate change. We're very, very proud that experts from the University of Maine, the University of Maine at Machias, the University of Maine School of Law, the University of Southern Maine, and the University of Maine at Farmington have played key roles in this work. UMaine's strengths and research span the entire uh, range of dimensions of climate. Our Climate Change Institute has a nearly 50 year history of polar exploration and discovery that has taken our researchers to the rooftop of the world where they've contributed to the collection of ice cores and the installation of weather stations at more, at more than 26,000 feet of elevation on Mount Everest. The Institute's Climate Reanalyzer is a platform for visualizing climate and weather data sets across the world, and it's utilized by educators, researchers, and news outlets to inform the world of how our climate is changing. Humane is also driving world-leading innovation in floating offshore wind technology that promises to provide the sustainable energy that we need to power our homes, schools, and factories, and to realize Maine's climate goals. And I'd like to note that Professor Habib Dagger is here, um, uh, the leader of that incredible work. So together, we must set our sights optimistically on the innovation and investment that we can achieve through partnership. The Climate Action Plan gives us the roadmap for that work. Developing renewable energy infrastructure and workforce, protecting our natural resources and the industries that depend on them, prioritizing equity throughout this work, and so much more must be a part of our shared strategy. And the University of Maine system, and particularly the University of Maine, are ready. We're committed to action that's immediate and impactful. As was announced earlier today, UMaine is collaborating with several local communities on a regional climate action and adaptation planning effort. I'm also very pleased to share now that UMaine has committed to reducing its net scope one greenhouse gas emissions to zero by 2030, shortening our original scope one timeframe to net zero by a full decade. That will require the work of all of us uh, to, do, to make this work. And to help us meet this commitment, we're currently studying the development of a new central steam plant that would run on renewable fuel. The proposed plant would provide renewable thermal energy for over 80% of the campus thermal load, thus reducing our steam plants fossil carbon emissions, fossil carbon emissions by more than 80%. We also have plans in place to reduce campus electrical and thermal demand through infrastructure upgrades and have significantly increased our annual procurement of renewably generated electricity. Moving forward, the UMaine Office of Sustainability, the Office of Facilities Management, and the UMaine System Office of Capital Planning and Project Management are committed to increasing the performance of new and existing buildings through higher operational energy efficiency standards and net, carbon, net zero carbon construction. I'm also very excited to tell you that we're collaborating closely with partners and stakeholders to establish the University of Maine as the coordinating hub for ongoing research that supports the work of the Maine Climate Council as called for in Maine Won't Wait. Thanks to the administration's leadership, Maine is aggressively responding to the climate crisis through research, education, and outreach. 
Maine's land grant, sea grant, and space grant university will be a committed partner, and I hope an essential resource in ensuring that Maine's continued leadership in working toward a thriving future for, for Maine is successful. Again, welcome to this wonderful event. Thank you for coming to Orono to be with us and to have your meeting for your climate council, and uh, we look forward to the partnerships as we go forward. With that, it is an honor to introduce Governor Janet Mills. Thank you, Joe, and thank you for having us here. Thank you for hosting and, and helping and staffing up the Climate Council. Uh, and this work is so important. I've, I've been skimming the science update and the uh, one year anniversary sort of update. And it's uh, so refreshing to see so many faces here from diverse regions of the state, diverse backgrounds, all of you who have come together in the last year plus to talk about climate change in Maine. And we're seeing actions at every level. And it's amazing when you start to change the vocabulary, change the culture of a place to begin as Lydia Bloom has done in the legislature with her uh, Seacoast caucus, caucus um, understanding and bringing home the impacts of rising sea levels and warming seas and the ticks that uh, Professor Fernandez uh, mentioned earlier and all the different aspects of climate change that we're seeing, movement of the lobsters, uh, uh, drought, and then heavy rains, extreme weather conditions, how to mitigate, how to first acknowledge that it exists, understand it, and then move on. And we're seeing so many great things happening when it's, whether it's um, Habib's excellent work on floating offshore wind platforms and cross laminated timber and bridges in a backpack and all those wonderful things that the university is doing in the Advanced Technology Center. Uh, to four main and inventing new uses for forest products, biofuels and, uh, and nanocellular technology. Um, and when we're seeing things in Madison, Maine, using wood products for insulation of homes and businesses. It's amazing. Things are happening across the state of Maine. I went to a baseball bat, bat manufacturing a small plant in Dover Foxcroft. And for years, they had been dealing with tons of waste they take a 16 pound cube or a solid block of wood and, and then the ultimate bat is what, eight ounces or something. All that way, and they bought a machine and they reinvented themselves. And now they take the wood waste and make it into blocks for firewood, for fire stars. People are in reinventing things and the way they do things. So much has changed just in the last year since we were together. And again, a year ago, Maine won't wait. Um, it is a bold action plan. I'm so pleased that we're ahead of the curve now in the state of Maine. And it's, um, we're looking at other states to catch up now. We are catching up and we, they're gonna catch up. Hopefully they'll be looking to catch up to us. We have just so much to be proud of. We talked about this outdoors. The number, the thousands of electric vehicles, more than 6,000 sold this past year or so even in the course of a pandemic and with supply chain, chain issues as they are. Uh, heat pumps, 28,000 in one year alone, from July to July of this year, July 2020 to July 2021, about 40,000 heat pumps total. A uh, ton of them are in the Blaine house. <laughs> Some of them aren't working, but we're gonna change that. Um, this is 23 heat pumps in the Blaine house. Uh, and I won't take credit for that, but I will take credit for the solar panels, 24 of them on the, on the um, uh, garage, the, the roof of the garage at the Blaine House. And with that tracking device, that huge tracking device, we kiddingly call it our drive-in theater uh, movie screen, but we're saving about 25% of electric, electricity costs just in the Blaine House with that mechanism. Uh, so we're seeing those kinds of actions all over the state of Maine. And um, working with communities now, getting into the local levels, talking to people about what's really on the ground and in the water and how we can help towns and cities and counties and regional groups. I love to see the uh, Port, uh, Greater Portland Cog and, and those kinds of entities looking to you know, tighten up their transportation uh, issues, looking at using the federal infrastructure money for bike paths and other alternatives to fossil fuel vehicles and whatnot, and rural transportation. When I grew up in Farmington, it was the blue line that came up twice a week, I think, from Lewiston, and that's how you got out of town. <laughs> and even that stopped after a while. 
there was no there's now no railroad line through Farmington. There's no bus line. And things are going to change. And, and a, an electric bus, an MDI, amazing. And it's going to be it's going to be a payback for the town, for the school district. The savings in fossil fuels with the increase in gas and oil prices now, we've got to do everything we can to wean ourselves off of fossil fuels. You know that more than $4 billion a year goes out the door, goes out of our pockets and into out-of-state and international fossil fuel companies just for us to pay for heating oil for our homes. That's got to stop. It doesn't make any economic sense. And climate-wise, we've got to reduce our dependency on fossil fuels. So I'm excited about, about new initiatives like the one in Casco Bay, where 10 different communities are working together to prevent future flooding, restoring the salt marshes and beach dunes, making rain gardens to reduce store. I don't what's a rain garden? There used to be a rain barrel in my backyard, but all right, rain garden now to reduce stormwater runoff and landscaping parks to reduce flooding and runoff and protecting shorelines using natural materials rather than seawalls. And here in Orono, the town of Orono and the city of Bangor, partnering with the University of Maine and Huston College in a regional climate planning process. That's what we got to keep doing. And I'm so proud of this area for doing, for starting the process. These partnerships would not be possible at all without the science and the support of the Maine Climate Council. You folks show our state every day how very important it is to mobilize the public, to change the, the tenor of the conversation, to talk about science, 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 and fact, and change the and mobilize the pu public sector and the private sector to meet these extraordinary challenges. Red Code for Humanity. It's no joke. Red code for humanity. We're there together to help defeat and mitigate and address climate change at every level in every way we can. So thank you for your continuing to your continuing work to protect this precious place that we call home, our great state of Maine, and ensure that future generations can live here and enjoy the bounty and the beauty of this state that we love so much. Thank you all. Thank you, Governor, for those remarks. And as the governor said, you know, one of the very important things that this council has done is to have an emphasis and a focus on science. And so it is my pleasure to introduce our co-chairs for the science and technical subcommittee. Dr. Ivan Fernandez is a soil scientist and distinguished Maine professor with the University of Maine School of Forest Resources and Climate Change Institute. He's also a member of the Climate Council and co-chair of the STS subcommittee. Dr. Susie Arnold, a new member joining us uh, with the Climate Council, is a marine scientist with the Island Institute. In her work, Dr. Arnold focuses on the impacts of climate change and ocean acidification on marine resources and fishery dependent communities. She is a new third co-chair of the subcommittee. And he's not in the room with us today, but I'd also like to thank Dr. Steve Dixon, the new state geologist and marine geologist with the Maine Geological Survey for staying on as co-chair of the subcommittee and helping to lead the creation of Maine Climate Science Update 2021, which I believe Dr. Fernandez and Dr. Arnold will present to us. Well, good afternoon, um, and uh, thank you for the introduction, uh, Commissioner Neloisum, and um, thank you for uh, all of your leadership, uh, Governor Mills, um, and uh, I don't know where our president went, but uh, uh, our own president, uh, Farini Monday, here at the University of Maine, uh, and a number of distinguished uh, guests and colleagues uh, uh, in the room this afternoon. Um, as uh, Commissioner Loisem uh, indicated, uh, my, my charge here, or our charge here this afternoon for a few minutes is to talk about um, the uh, update report that you have uh, that I think has been uh, distributed from the Scientific and Technical Subcommittee. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, certain uh, components of that uh, relative to its content. Uh, and then I'll turn it over to my able colleague, Dr. Arnold, um, to, uh, to complete the task. 
Before we do, uh, I rarely certainly have the uh, honor of being in the presence of uh, my governor. And I, I, I want to take a, a sidebar for a minute to stay. During the campaign, I was driving home one evening in my little Tacoma pickup truck, backing in my driveway. It was dark. Um, and the phone rang, uh, and it was you, Governor. Uh, and you talked about um, your campaign and, and your initiatives briefly. Uh, but I immediately launched into my three-minute elevator speech on uh, the main climate assessments that we've done here at the University of Maine and the climate adaptation work that the state had done in the past. Um, and uh, I got into my driveway, turned the engine off, and then you launched into your climate spiel. And you... And you're still talking. You did a far better job than I do. So in all seriousness, thank you for your leadership in moving us forward. So, um, well, I guess I have still have to point it this way. Or not. There we go. So um, the Scientific and Technical Subcommittee of the uh, Maine Climate Council is a 31 member committee, uh, bipartisan representation from the legislature, uh, and uh, then a whole bunch of uh, really, really talented scientists from throughout, uh, uh, throughout Maine. Uh, as probably everyone uh, knows, last year we uh, completed a, a comprehensive assessment, a 370 page light reading about the impacts of climate change in Maine, uh, its consequences, its changes and the projections uh, uh, going forward. This uh, update is not an update for that comp comprehensive report. We will again do a comprehensive assessment uh, in support of the work of the council and the working groups uh, in anticipation of the quadrennial update update of uh, Maine won't wait in, in a couple of years. Uh, this is an update uh, sort of uh, midstream to just uh, remind folks uh, that uh, the climate is still changing, that science is still uh, taking place, uh, and that uh, we're doing a lot of work, as is evident in the documents that you have, uh, and yet there's still a lot of work to be done. So this report has uh, really three short sections. Uh, I'm going to talk about the first two quite briefly. Uh, and then turn it over to Dr. Arnold to uh, uh, talk about the, uh, the third one. Um, the first one is uh, climate in the news in 2021. And so this is really uh, pointing to what we all recognize is you can't pick up a, a paper or listen to the radio or watch TV uh, without often hearing about climate events around the world. Um, and uh, news is not science. Uh, so today's news is tomorrow's science. As these events occur, they are consistent with what was predicted. Uh, they are consistent with what we are experiencing increasingly year in and year out. Uh, and they are consistent with the science that later on tells us what percentage was attributable to rising greenhouse gases, what the increase in frequency was, what are the mechanisms behind it. That's the science. Uh, nevertheless, uh, looking at the news and the news events obviously is an expression of our changing climate uh, in real time. And so in 2021, much like uh, every year uh, in the recent years, we've seen a, a cascade of climate events. Uh, we saw early in the year the, uh, an Indian Himalayan uh, glacier that was melting faster than anticipated that burst, took out two hydroelectric uh, plants and uh, destroyed uh, lives and, and obviously a tremendous amount of economic uh, damage. Flooding events began early and were evident throughout the year with a two foot rain in 24 hours in Hawaii on March 7th, followed by flooding in China, Germany, the US and Italy, which set a European record for 29 inches in 12 hours. Uh, in August, it rained at the summit of the Greenland ice sheet for the first time. Hurricane season started out as another record breaker with Claudette, Elsa, Grace and Nicholas in the news but the uh, pace of hurricanes slowed mid-season, um, yet it was still the second year in a row that we ran out of Greek letters to name uh, these tropical storms, 21 in total, uh, third highest on record. Uh, Ida, Ida IDA, uh, captured our attention, and I suspect everyone remembers it uh, being in the news. Uh, it hit um, the um, uh, southern coast as a Category 4 hurricane, making landfall on a, August 29th, coincidentally, the 16th anniversary of Hurricane Katrina, um, leaving uh, devastation in Louisiana and Mississippi, only to traverse the eastern seaboard, um, bringing extensive flooding to Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and New York. 
Ida was the largest storm to hit the region since Hurricane Sandy with $64.5 billion in damage, 96 deaths, and ranking as the fifth most costly weather disaster in, the, in world history, uh, according to NOAA. Here in Maine, we experienced a number of torrential rain events again in, 19, in 2021. Uh, with notable uh, news items that we uh, probably uh, all saw. Five to six inch rainfall occurred in just a few hours in down East Maine on June 9th, and it uh, destroyed over 10 miles of the carriage trails in Acadia National Park. It took the Park Service the rest of the summer to repair. Uh, another example being in October, there was a downpour in the mid coast area uh, with power, out power outages and flash flooding. Lest we just talk about the wet side of extreme events, um, we also saw a heat wave hit the Pacific Northwest this summer in June and July, uh, the uh, famous heat dome uh, that some scientists uh, early on identified as being uh, impossible to occur the way it did uh, without the impacts of uh, the greenhouse gas forcing. Uh, half the nation was in drought by midsummer, including all of Maine, once again. Uh, however, fortunately this year, as compared to last year, uh, midsummer rains brought relief in Maine, um, uh, but not so for the western part of the United States, and certainly uh, our agriculture in Maine uh, benefited by those rains. For the first time, a tier one water shortage was declared for the Colorado River, which has reached a low of nearly a third storage capacity in its uh, reservoirs, Lakes Mead and Powell. July was the Earth's hottest month ever recorded, according to NOAA. Uh, 2021 is expected to be among the seven hottest years on record, uh, of which is the last seven years. Fires raged across the US again in 2021. As of November, the National Interagency Fire Center lists over 52,000 year-to-date fire incidents in the US, burning over 6.6 .6 million acres, uh, with a five-year average fire suppression cost of $2.3 billion per year. Smoke from the fires traversed the United States uh, and arrived blanketing uh, Portland, Maine, our Portland, uh, uh, on July 28th. As of October 8th, the US has experienced 18 weather climate disaster events with losses exceeding $1 billion that included drought, flooding, severe storm, tropical cyclone, wildfire, and winter storm events. Nearly one in three Americans live in a county that was hit by an extreme weather disaster this summer. Clearly, climate change the intensification of the uh, climate cycle and extreme events are part of our day in and day out life that we live now throughout the planet, as well as here in Maine, uh, and that is anticipated to continue. And as the science teases apart the realities and the data collected for all of this, we learn more and more about the role that uh, rising greenhouse gases and other factors of, uh, of human intervention and natural causes uh, contribute to these phenomena. Okay, so that, that's in the news. The second part of the report has to do with uh, important uh, science internationally or nationally. And uh, we talked about this, we as a, a council in September at our third quarterly meeting for this year, um, particularly focusing on uh, the IPCC report. Now, I'm not gonna repeat uh, what we talked about during that, nor am I gonna move the slide forward, I guess. Um, whoop. There we go. Um, in August, uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, released uh, the AR6 report, uh, assessment report number six. They've been doing this periodically since 1990. Um, and as usual, the first installment was the physical basis, which uh, uh, captured a lot of the news cycle and obviously was uh, uh, um, an important piece of science that was uh, that it supported COP26 in, in Glasgow this uh, earlier this uh, fall. As you recall, um, the report uh, pointed out uh, that not only are uh, climate indicators changing, but they're accelerating in their rates of change. Um, the changes in global surface temperature uh, relative to 1850 to 1900 uh, are more rapid than they have been in the last 2000 years. Uh, the, the, each of the last four decades is, has been warmer than the prior uh, decade. Uh, and a, a number of, of the other indicators of uh, climate change, as we detail in our report, um, are also increasing and accelerating. The IPCC, I got to learn how to use this. There we go. 
Um, the IPC, uh, IPCC uh, um, had, uh, you know, a, a lot of technical information. Some of the highlights that we uh, talked about uh, prior recent changes in the climate are widespread, rapid, and intensifying. Uh, and unprecedented in thousands of years. And so we li we're living now in an, in an era that uh, has not existed in human experience, uh, nor will we be able to go back to the 20th century anytime. Um, it also stated that unless there are immediate rapid and large scale reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, limiting warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade, which is the uh, threshold that we um, have focused on, particularly since the uh, 2018 uh, IPCC report called 1.5 degrees centigrade, will be beyond reach. And the time gap is closing for us uh, as a planet uh, to move forward to achieve that goal, uh, which was uh, obviously front and center in the de uh, deliberations this fall in Glasgow. Um, I'm going to go on and talk just a couple of other uh, uh, reports that uh, also came out during this period. Uh, there was a number of organizations that actually did an analysis of the trajectories of, of CO2 emissions uh, going forward on, uh, on the plot on the left. This is from the International Energy Agency. Uh, the plot on the left shows the historical CO2 emissions, obviously uh, going up. Um, and then the projections uh, on the right are uh, future scenarios. Uh, with the color coded to the amount of global warming that we could expect uh, in the uh, for those circles on the right hand side. Uh, with the message here being that the stated policies going into this fall were would have put us a, a, above uh, 2.5 degrees warming by the end of the century. The announced pledges going into COP26 uh, would have put us up just above two. Um, the additional pledges, at least in this figure as of November 3rd, uh, would have put us around 1.8 degrees, uh, which still puts us far from where we need to be in order to be carbon neutral by the mid-century uh, if we are to achieve the goal of keeping below 1.5 degrees centigrade uh, for the planet by the, end of this, uh, by the end of this century. If only the rest of the world would do what Maine is doing. Uh, well, it's too fast. No, that's the one. Um, we all are aware, are aware that we experience uh, and are still experiencing um, a, a pandemic, uh, and uh, there was a great deal of uh, slowdown in economic and industrial activities um, and transportation during the uh, uh, during 2020. Uh, and yet, it only really uh, reduced the amount of uh, CO2 emissions by, uh, according to the Global Cl uh, Carbon Project uh, data, 5.4%, uh, and the uh, increase in activity in the in 2021 um, it has essentially uh, recovered all of that. And so we can expect that uh, CO2 emissions will continue uh, to increase without uh, dramatic declines going forward. Um, there was a number of other reports. We're not going to talk about all, all of them, about security, about migration, uh, tying to the importance of uh, the changing climate and how it's driving uh, dramatic changes in, in many aspects of our, uh, our society and our planet. A um, uh, couple I'll, I'll close out here with uh, one notable one was the uh, editors of all, a lot of the major uh, medical and health journals got together and wrote an editorial. And the editorial was published on September 5th. Uh, in over 200 of the medical journals uh, throughout the world, with the uh, message being pr primarily or particularly to uh, the, the folks meeting in, in Glasgow, that the greatest threat to global public health is a continued failure of world leaders to keep global temperature rise below 1.5 degrees centigrade, and importantly, to restore nature. And... Um, the last study I'll just point to that we mentioned in our, uh, our report uh, was this one that appeared in Science, and this one I, I think is particularly important uh, in the sense of our obligation to the generations that will follow. Um, these scientists uh, did an analysis of uh, uh, children born in 2020 as compared to a cohort of children born in 19. 60 um, and looked at the anticipated exposure to extreme events. Uh, and the plot here is just showing you data having to do with uh, exposure to heat wave. Uh, and uh, children born essentially today compared to when uh, 
some of us were born or, uh, or earlier than that, uh, a generation ago, are going to experience four to seven times uh, the exposure to extreme events. Um, and uh, you can see there it's color coded so that uh, the most aggressive action that does keep us to 1.5 degrees centigrade is still going to expose the, that generation to four times uh, the extreme events. And so we have a tremendous obligation to the generations that follow to be as uh, fastidious and focused as we can be to bend the curve in, in order to reach this goal. The third part of our report was uh, targeted to providing some examples uh, across a few areas. Uh, of ongoing science. So this is really the bread and butter of what climate assessment is about, what our other uh, re report, the full assessment was about, uh, peer reviewed and technical articles that have appeared in the last year since we uh, uh, released the 2020 report. Uh, and we, we focused on three areas, climate, uh, farms, forests, and biodiversity, um, as well as the marine sector. Uh, and so with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to my uh, distinguished colleague, Dr. Arnold, who uh, is far better uh, prepared and uh, able to walk us through the marine sector and some of the science that we're learning. Susie. I think it's going to... Is there anxiety? Yeah. You have a plug? Yeah. I'm going to have my computer up here so I can see my slides and see you. So thank you. Thank you very much, Ivan. I'm going to dive right in here now that I have clicker anxiety. Thanks. <laughs> here we go. Okay, so I'm going to start with touching on, as Ivan mentioned, I'm only, I'm only touching on the ocean uh, climate science today. Um, so I'm going to dive right into a few topics here, one of which is the changes in ocean circulation and um, how they're impacting the Gulf of Maine here. So I'm just going to familiarize you guys with a few features that will come up later in the talk here. So as you're probably, probably very well aware of, we've got the Gulf Stream bringing warmer water up uh, into our region. We've got the Labrador current coming down, bringing colder water from the Arctic. Um, this stands for Grand Banks. This is the tail of the Grand Banks. Here we've got the Gulf of St. Lawrence, the Western Scotian Shelf, the Bay of Fundy. This is the Gulf of Maine and the Northeast Channel and then George's Bank over here. So essentially a little bit of background. I guess I have this here for a reason here. Um, a little bit of background. So we know that Arctic warming and accelerating ice melt from Greenland are weakening something called the AMOC, and that stands for Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation. There's a reason why we uh, hyphenate that to AMOC. It's a mouthful. Um, so this weakening of the AMOC is linked with a northward shift of the Gulf Stream and a, a retreat of the Labrador current, which is resulting in warmer water entering the Gulf of Maine through the, the Northeast Channel here. So this isn't uh, very new science, but within the last year, there's been some new insights. So beginning in um, 2008, the, the Gulf Stream migrated closer to the tail of the Grand Banks here, reducing the input from the Labrador current. And within one year of the appearance of that warm, salty water in this area called the tail of the Grand Banks, the subsurface warming progressed in the Gulf of Maine. So essentially this helps us to interpret the rapid temperature change that we've been seeing in the Gulf of Maine. And it also importantly provides us the ability to kind of simulate the Gulf Stream Labrador current um, interactions and enhances the predictability of future warming in the Gulf of Maine. Okay, so we've been measuring ocean temperature in the Gulf of Maine for quite some time. This slide here shows temperature at the sea surface in the Gulf of Maine going back to about the 1880s. And this is a new interactive dashboard that's on the Maine Climate Council website. And what you can see is this dashed line here is sea surface temperatures or annual temperatures from 1880 to about current day. And then what these squiggly lines here are showing are the annual temperatures and sea surface temperature under three different emissions scenarios. So if you go out to 2050, uh, you can see that under that high emissions scenario, the Gulf of Maine is, is forecasted to be 55 degrees Fahrenheit. And if you look at the historical average of what we've experienced since the last 
150 years, nearly 150 years, you can see that the historical average temperature was 48.6 degrees. So what we would be looking at in 2050 under this high emission scenario is down east Maine coastal temperatures similar to southern New England seawater temperatures today. Thanks. So uh, southern New England uh, water temperatures don't sound so bad for swimming, but they're having drastic impacts on our marine species. So in particular, they're changing the distribution abundance of, of key species. Well, what we can see here is that that change in the distribution abundance of the American lobster, our leading fishery here in the Gulf of Maine. If you look over here at this panel on the left, what you're looking at is biomass of lobsters per tow back in the early 1970s. The reds here are indicating higher biomass, so more lobsters caught in the toes, and the blues are indicative of uh, lower biomass per toes. So you can see these hot spots of biomass abundance are located kind of off Cape Cod and then southern New England. Fast forward a few decades to a couple of years ago, the same toes looking for the same species in the same water are finding that uh, hot spots of biomass has, have shifted dramatically to down east Maine and also offshore. Next slide, please. Thank you. So um, what, what we know is that these changes in temperature are not just impacting fisheries, but they're also having drastic disruptions in predator prey dynamics. We know that marine species, and this is marine ectotherms versus terrestrial ectotherms, marine species have a much higher sensitivity to warmer, to warming and faster rates of colonization than terrestrial species. We also know that local extirpations related to warming have been twice as common in the ocean as on land and species turnover is faster in the ocean. So I'd be remiss if I didn't share with you a recent uh, review paper that was published by lead author Andy Pershing, former chief scientist of the Gulf of Maine Research Institute and member of the Maine Climate Council and Scientific and Technical Subcommittee. So Andy and many other colleagues from Maine institutions and elsewhere um, published this great review paper uh, entitled Climate Impacts on the Gulf of Maine Ecosystem, a review of observed and expected changes in 2050 from rising temperatures. And essentially they look at some, some key species going out to 2050 and make some predictions about what populations will look like for these key species. So you can see these arrows here uh, where they, the authors are projecting declines in populations of lobsters, of cod, of this key, um, a species called Calanus finmarchicus, which is a zooplankton species that is essentially the basis of our marine food web here in the Gulf of Maine, declines in herring, um, also declines in some seabirds like Atlantic puffins. The horizontal here uh, arrow here is indicating that uh, we're projecting changes in migration patterns of things like endangered whales. Uh, but then we're seeing some increase in, in species like longfin squid, or black seabed, which are warm water species that we're seeing more commonly already in the Gulf of Maine. Next slide, thanks. Okay, so um, we're also seeing changing predator prey, prey relationships having huge impacts on fisheries. So this example that I'm gonna share with you has to do with Northern shrimp and the subsequent crash of that fishery. So we know that uh, the fishery has been closed since 2013 and it has not been reopened since. And it was closed following an extreme marine heat wave in the Gulf of Maine in 2012. And essentially um, what new, these new findings from this paper here published this, this past year have shown that it, yes, the decline has a lot to do with water temperature, but it also has to do with the introduction of a new voracious predator in the form of a long thin squid that entered the Gulf of Maine in this particularly warm year. So it entered the Gulf of Maine earlier in the spring of um, 2012 when we had that early onset of spring. And at that time, it coincided with the female shrimp inshore. And so then that, that warming persisted through the summer and we had a lot of squid coming into the Gulf of Maine and overlapping with that shrimp, shrimp population, which led to months of just a high level of predation that essentially decimated, uh, decimated that shrimp fishery. Let me try a different button this time. There we go. 
Okay, so um, something you've been hearing a lot about on the news recently are endangered uh, right whales. And so there's a really important paper that's come out in the last year talking about the impacts of changing ocean conditions on the North Atlantic right whale. And so you'll remember I spoke about this kind of regime shift that happened in the Gulf of Maine right around 2009. Well, this paper analyzes the impacts of this, these changing ocean conditions on this species here. So it does it uh, basically looks at two, two decades, 2000 to 2009 and 2010 to 2019. And essentially from 2000 to 2009, that Gulf Stream wasn't yet meandering and that warm water was not yet entering the Gulf of Maine. So we had high prey availability for right whales, mostly in the form of that Calinus finmarchicus zooplankton species. We saw the North Atlantic right whale summering in their kind of traditional foraging grounds in the Gulf of Maine, particularly in the Bay of Fundy here and also offshore in the Gulf of Maine. And the, they exhibited higher calving and lower mortality rates during that decade. So fast forward to the next decade, we had the Gulf Stream meandering a lot of that warm water entering the Gulf of Maine, resulting in lower prey availability for the whales. That summer foraging had shifted away from the Gulf of Maine and into the Gulf of St. Lawrence. And we saw lower calving and higher mortality rates of the, this endangered whale. Oops. So I'm going to switch gears here a little bit, um, shifting away from fisheries, but still staying somewhat on the topic of ocean circulation, but moving to how that impacts is causes of sea level change. So we know that the majority of sea level rise is caused due to volumetric increase. So that is basically the, the melting of land-based ice sheets, as well as thermal expansion, because we have warming water expanding. But there's also other factors at play, including ocean circulation and gravitational forces. <clears throat> so in the last SDS report, we talked about how that weakening AMOC is resulting in increasing sea levels in the Gulf of Maine. So I won't touch on that concept here, but I do want to touch on a few new pieces of information that have been brought to our attention over the last year. This is not a new concept, how the lunar nodal cycle impacts sea levels, but it has some pretty immediate consequences for us here in Maine. So I wanted to bring it up. Um, so basically the lunar nodal cycle is a natural cycle of the orbits of the earth and the moon, and it exaggerates and mutes tides on earth and thus enhances or suppresses the effects of sea level rise. So what we're looking at here in this panel is, this is, happens to be data from Miami, but it's just an example. Um, we're looking at the sea level rise linear trend here in blue. And then over it, we have this, um, this lunar nodal cycle. And, and what I wanna bring home here is that we are currently in a downward phase of the lunar nodal cycle, which is reducing the impacts of sea level rise, particularly over the next few years. So after, so here we are in 2021, this dash line. After about 2025, we'll start the upward phase of this cycle. And by 2030, or a little sooner, the rate of sea level rise will likely rise significantly over this linear trend here for about a decade, from about 2030 to 2040. So this possible temporary reprieve that we may be experiencing over the next few years should not mask the fact that it will be replaced by an even faster rate. So that's important when it comes to uh, our, um, our preparation for that decade. Okay, so basically we have been and we will continue to track rising sea levels here in Maine and we have five tide gauges. Here's another really neat interactive dashboard coming out of the Maine Climate Council. Um, essentially, this is the data from the Bar Harbor tide gauge. And what you are seeing here is sea level variability by month in Bar Harbor. So this is the historical average line right here. These are the lows by month. And these are the kind of record high months here. And the black line is showing you the current year, so 2021. And unfortunately, uh, we're doing a lot of record breaking at all the, all the tide gauges. And you can see here, if you look at September and October 2021, um, saw record high monthly means at that tide gauge. On the interactive dashboard, you can also look at the, the rate of rise since the in in statement of that tide gauge, which was 1947. So you can have a nice, nice long 
uh, rate to look at. And then if you compare that rate in the last uh, 25 years, you can see that it is in fact increasing. Okay, as I mentioned, I'll just reiterate this. As I mentioned, 2021 broke a lot of records for sea level rise, um, not just the Bar Harbor tide gauge, but all of the tide gauges. So I won't um, read through this, but as you can see, uh, you don't see many dates from the 1940s or 50s on this chart. They're all in about the last decade. So um, just a little bit more bad news, and then I promise I'm gonna end on a high note. Um, so something else to be aware of, uh, related to the, the new science that's come out in the last year has to do with changes in storm tracks and activity. So some background um, that we knew already is that tropical cyclone or TC activity is changing with the warming planet. So some things that we knew already were that they are increasing in occurrence and intensity. They are coming along with more precipitation and they are increasing in um, their storm surge that are the, the flooding of um, storm surge that are associated with these with these uh, tropical cyclones. So a couple new insights that are important are that the tracks are in fact shifting poleward and westward. That's bad news for us. Um, potentially impacting unprepared regions not typically affected by intense tropical cyclones. Also, tropical cyclone activity close to land is increasing and we're seeing increased stalling of Atlantic tropical cyclones with a substantial increase in risk to coastal regions. So basically what you're seeing here are 2020 Atlantic storm tracks um, and they're shifting poleward and westward. And then the, the major take homes from this paper here are that tropical cyclones are declining in their distance from land, meaning they're getting closer to land and that the percent of them that are entering coastal regions is increasing, and that the time that they're spending in coastal regions is also increasing. So as promised, I'm going to end on some positive um, notes, which have to do with the advance, advances in climate services of farmed seaweeds. So we have some great potential here in Maine around this area because of our vast coastline and of our previous success in um, farming seaweeds. So this, these figures here come from a paper uh, modi modified by me, uh, but the paper is by Carlos Duarte. And essentially um, he and his co-authors are emphasizing the real need for um, farming seaweed globally in order to meet uh, several UN sustainable development goals. So I found this to be very interesting and worth sharing. So. What you'll notice here is that all of the eco service, ecosystem services noted in this paper that come from farming seaweed, they all ladder up to this UN sustainability development goal of climate action. And I'll bring your attention to those ecosystem services that are in this box here, because these are ones that we are particularly focused on here in Maine. And they include the ability of seaweeds to uptake carbon. They include the ability of seaweeds to uh, increase pH or locally ameliorate acidification. And they include the, include the ability for seaweeds to actually assimilate nutrients, essentially meaning that they take up nitrogen and phosphorus and other nutrients that we have in coastal zones that we have too much of in coastal zones, in fact. Another thing I wanted to bring your attention to is the importance of what we do when we harvest the seaweed, which is that it can be a substitute for products with much larger carbon footprints. So first and foremost, food. Uh, also, bioenergies, bioplastics, um, even food additives for cows, which we have billions of on the planet, and uh, they actually emit a ton of methane. So by adding, adding uh, seaweeds into their food, it's possible that, that we could reduce their, their methane-rich burps. It's no joke. Um, okay, so finally, in conclusion, um, obviously the evidence of a changing climate and its effects are ongoing as is the science that the Maine Climate Council looks to in guiding the implementation and updates to the Maine Climate Action Plan. Um, and I, would, I think I'll take my STS um, hat off for a minute and just provide some, some personal insights. Um, I think that we're all reminded of the impacts and consequences of climate change every day, either through our personal experience or the news that Ivan presented here. And I think that demonstrating the the biological and the physical consequences 
is relatively straightforward. I don't think it's something that we can really deny anymore. I think the, the more complex nut to crack is the human dimension of behavior change. I think it's extremely complex. And so Ivan and I have done our best to present what we think are the key messages that uh, we presented in our report. And um, I want to acknowledge that these are our key messages, but they may not be your key messages and they may not be the key messages that resonate with your constituency. So uh, as a call to action, I would, I would challenge you and, and listeners today to come up with your key messages. They might not have to do with biodiversity or forests or marine life. They might have more to do with public health or children like Ivan mentioned in that report or the economy or the elderly. Um, so I would challenge you to, to think of what, uh, who your audience is and what messages will resonate with them because I think that is what is important to prompt uh, behavior change. So I wanted to thank the governor and also to uh, ensure everyone that we will continue to do our best to have Maine continue to lead and continue to address the barriers to adopting change. Thank you. We have a couple minutes for questions. Ivan, do you wanna come up here? No. No, you have to come up here. Um, so any questions for Ivan, doctors Ivan and Susie, Dr. Susie. Um, so I, I actually might just kick it off by asking you both. You've done an excellent job laying out the science as you reflected on what we are continuing to see. Is there anything when you think about what we act as a council or sort of thinking about we're already, Cassie's already asking us when we're gonna start the next plan. Is there any science where you feel like, all right, Maine needs to focus more in this area based on the science that you're learning? Or have we done everything perfectly? Our, our co-chairs have done everything perfectly. Um, I, I guess the, all of the science needs to continue sort of across the board. And that's part of what Susie just described the examples of in the Marine and, uh, and ongoing. I think what we're learning is the importance for us to be able to um, evaluate, document, measure, monitor, our success. Uh, as we go, we continue to do science, uh, evaluating options for our response, not just ecological response, but uh, how, how do we address this? Natural climate solutions is an example. How do we use our farms and forests, et cetera? But embedded in that challenge is how do we measure that progress? And so how do we know that we've succeeded five and 10 years from now relative to storing carbon in, in these natural resources or in, in, in blue uh, uh, or in the marine sector in blue carbon uh, as it's called. So um, I, I don't think anything jumps out. And uh, you know, as you hear from what we describe in the science, if the world was on the same trajectory that Maine was on, we'd be in a lot better uh, shape. Um, I think we just need to stay the course with our plan revisit it, you know, as we will uh, on a quadrennial basis and identify priority research needs as we go in the implementation. So I, I think, good job. Yeah, the only thing I would add that I already spoke about was that eye-opening piece of, we may be in this kind of lull of, um, of what we're seeing in terms of sea level rise, but we can anticipate that to accelerate pretty quickly in the next, well, 2030 to 2040. So. We may have a window where we can act now in order to prepare ourselves better for that that coming um, acceleration. Other questions in the room? Judy, you want to come up to this mic? Sorry to put you on the spot. So. Sounds like. So thank you for the presentation and just extraordinary work. Um, I wanted to pick up on the change in human behavior difficulty. And one of the things that the resilience group had to kind of punt on, given all that we were working on, was the whole question of getting out of harm's way and retreat from these vulnerable areas. And I'm wondering whether there are 
social scientists perhaps on the science and technical committee that might address just the difficulty in having the conversations around retreat and all the implications of that in terms of infrastructure and property tax space and just inequity and, and there's so many issues, but any thoughts around that on the science and technical committee? Well, uh, so we've talked about that relative to the breadth of coverage in the science and technical committee. We've got 31 members now and we really focus on the climate system uh, and its effects, particularly on natural resources, et cetera. We aren't comprehensive relative to the social sciences, relative to engineering, uh, th that type of thing. Some of that, we look to the working groups uh, to integrate the science with implementation and, and apply sort of the, the skills of social sciences to do that. Um, we have a little bit of social science experience. Uh, people like Susie work across the board, you know, sort of in the trenches. Um, we have economists on the, uh, on the council that have that kind of experience, but we don't have sort of a full uh, cohort of, of social scientists, given the focus of the way the, the STS is, is structured. Uh, I agree with you, that's, that's an area that um, deserves uh, additional attention. Where that best resides uh, is, uh, I think, a, an ongoing discussion for us to have relative to the structure of the council uh, and the tasks ahead. Hi, uh, I've been relative to the chart from science that you showed about effects on uh, intergenerational effects. Uh, I wonder if you know uh, if that includes just the temperature uh, levels that were referenced or if it builds in feedback loops that are likely to occur to accelerate those temperature levels uh, as well. Things like um, peat and moss and, uh, you know, uh, Arctic peat carbon releases and such. And a second question relative to that is, although that graphed exposure to extreme events, and as a scientist, you probably won't want to generalize, but it occurs to me that extreme events are merely one color on the palette that intergenerational effects will witness. Uh, they are likely to also witness more tick exposures and other disease implications as well. Uh, any reflections or opinions on the generalizability of that data would also be interesting. Thank you. Um, so I'll start. So for that, uh, thanks, Ken. Uh, specific study, I, I, I don't recall all of the details. Uh, specifically, it was the standard sort of climate models going forward. They typically don't incorporate tipping points, which is the kind of thing that you're addressing um, in their projections. They're sort of the tried and true state of the art, uh, CMIP 6 probably suite of uh, models going forward. It did address other indicators of extreme events besides just the heat waves, although they were all sort of in that same sort of multiplier effect uh, at the different, uh, uh, different levels. No question, there's a suite of um, quality of life and condition of the environment and sort of planetary health that uh, go with that. I, you know, I was thinking about that, but partly the reason we include that is it's just so compelling what we owe the generations to, to come. And uh, the, the tendency of what we see is for, um, as we look at data, the, you know, increased acceleration of things like uh, Susie was talking about relative to uh, ocean warming or, or temperatures. And they're incremental. Uh, sometimes they're a little bit logarithmic. Um, but what really is compelling is these, what we might call the scientists, stochastic events, um, you know, uh, storms and hurricanes, what have you. Um, and when you look at the increased frequency, it doesn't take much to go from two times to five times to 10 times. And so we see the biggest increases often in the data around those kinds of exposures. But they're, they're very real because just one event uh, does obviously so much more damage uh, than some of the incremental changes that we, we experience. And I think that's just one study that's an indicator of the kind of multiplier effect that we're leaving for future generations if we don't get this done. Thanks very much. And I can testify personally about Hurricane Ida 
having been en route uh, to a wedding in Philadelphia mm -hmm. on September 1st and flash flooding my brand new pickup truck. <laughs> uh, but fortunately that compares favorably with the 41 people who lost their lives yeah. uh, that night. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Yes. <laughs> well, what I found, thank you, it was a really good presentation. What I found interesting is the talk about AMOC and, and the, the need for more information, but the, the newest indication is that there's real, a real problem with it. I mean, it's a very scary problem. What are we doing in Maine to monitor that, or are we involved in any of that kind of uh, research? Ah, thanks. <laughs> um, so that's probably a Sean Burkle question, Representative okay. Bloom. Um, but it's it's a great question. I mean, I talk about tipping points. I mean, with the enhanced Arctic um, warming and the the melt coming off of Greenland, it's having a big impact on AMOC. And it seems like every year um, AMOC is tied to more things by the scientific community. As far as what we're doing to track. Amok, that would be a Sean Burkle question, I think, um, unless Ivan, you have an answer. Yeah, no, I, 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 I can punt <laughs> as, yeah. as well. I mean, the, the systems to track it are out there. The data exists. And, and Sean, our state climatologist and the Climate Change Institute and Cooperative Extension is um, you know, a good example of someone who writes the scripts that grabs those data to, uh, to track it. And so he's the one that uh, points to the different studies and the trends in the data. So we have access to the data to understand it. Now, how we're using it and how we're uh, applying it to sort of decision-making is a good question. I can't uh, address just that right one now. One more follow-up on the, um, the sea level rise and the, the, the nodal. Uh, the, I didn't understand that before, that there's, is there any, should we be doing more monitoring? Should we have more tide gauges? Should we be doing some more uh, so we can really pinpoint and see how quickly when we get to that upward, how fast that's going. Would that be helpful for our communities? Yeah, I mean, I think no one would argue with putting out more tide gauges, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, having that local data is, is really imperative. Um, I mean, the fact that we have five here in Maine is good, but you have to consider that our coastline is longer than California's. So five seems good, but in reality, when you look at the, the, coast, the miles of coastline that we have, it's pretty sparse. Thank but, you. But I, I would add to that, and probably Dr. Arnold and yourself, Representative Bloom, um, know about some of these communities. I was down at Belfast for their tide gauge ceremony and they talked about a number of different system sensors. They're not the official NOAA tide gauges, but there are other sensor systems that are being applied in some of these coastal communities to measure and add data. And it's sort of like citizen science in that regard. Um, and they're doing a great job. They had multiple layers of sensor systems, for example, at, at Belfast, and I, I forget the other cycle, and I, I think a couple of other communities. So I think we will have a richer data set uh, that is above and beyond the official uh, NOAA data, which is sort of the, the gold standard, but we can compare to that. So I, I think we're making, advance, uh, uh, take, uh, making advances. Um, and certainly coastal communities are acutely aware of it, and many of them are interested. And you're going to you're going to include that in your next report, then I would hope you'd include some of these other tide gauges that may not be NOAA's. We we could, depending on the the availability of the their data relative to is it uh, QA'd and uh, is it put into a platform that we can apply. Um, I don't think we would be as STS the first to publish the data. Okay. Pre-processing, but post-processing, sure. It's, right. it's harder to include that in that it doesn't have that long-term trend like the tide right. gauges that have been in place for 80 years, but I think it's certainly a, a must in terms of the citizen science, citizen science efforts to bring the awareness to the community. There's nothing better than, than that in terms of awareness raising. Great. Well, thank you. Anything else? Why not? Also back. Also back. <laughs> right. um, thanks so much for those that presentation that was really informative. Um, just reflecting on um, Ivan, your statement about if the world was doing what Maine would be was doing, we'd be in a much better place. And also reflecting on the slide of 
the pledges um, of different countries and where that'll get us. And um, I think as Representative Bloom and I learned in Glasgow, a lot of those are just pledges and you know, not necessarily going to be actualized without you know, big policy changes. So I feel nervous about that. And so I guess my question is, um, what can Maine's role be in not only reaching you know, our, own, our own emissions reductions, but playing a role in um, you know, mitigating some of the emissions reductions that won't be happening um, globally? And, and how can we kind of go above and beyond um, not only to you know protect our own state, but make sure that um, I don't know, just that that we're doing more than um, or or making up for the inaction that's help, happening happening elsewhere. That makes sense. Well, um, thank you, Anya, uh, and thank you both for uh, being at COP and representing our our, our state there. Um, I, I, two things. One that comes to mind. One is. Um, you know, lead by example that we've already talked about. I, I, I think it's tremendously important um, to lead by example for us now as a state to have this kind of an action plan. I hear in other states or from other states, you know, this sort of vertical integration of the, uh, an action plan and the science that's supporting it, what have you. Um, I, I uh, you know, I've got, got a slide in climate talks that are, what are the reasons for hope? And, and um, there, there's a few of them, I won't do that talk right now, but uh, one of the things I really believe is that just like we see an acceleration in these trends of change, like ocean warming, and uh, I think there's going to be an equal acceleration in a response, in solutions. As people see more and more, we're going to see it right now in transportation. You know, we saw it 25, 30 years ago uh, with computers and the internet. These things take off and they take off uh, logarithmically once they uh, once they get going. So I think leading by um, by uh, example is probably the most important thing we're doing right now as a state because um, we're we're doing a really pretty good job given we're uh, we've just been through this for a, a year and a half or something like that. Um, you know, from the standpoint of what we can do beyond, uh, I'm pretty sure, pretty confident, uh, I, I look to our co-chairs, but that we will be carbon neutral by our target in 2045, probably before. Uh, there are probably other uh, aspects of uh, natural climate solutions and carbon sequestration that we can contribute to the world in order to offset the deficiencies of, of the response uh, elsewhere. Uh, but uh, of course, what we do in, in Washington and how we move the needle on national and international politics, like both of you contributed to by going to the COP26 meetings, uh, is also part of that solution. So, Well, Anya, what came to mind for me was that um, because we are a state that's heavily dependent on natural resources for much of our economy, um, I think that our story can be shared with other states that have a heavy dependence on natural resources that may be less inclined to be as motivated as we have been in terms of climate action. So our story may resonate with, with states that could, could kind of take our lead and that, that may help turn the needle in our country anyway. Thanks. All right. Thank you both. You